Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Stephen Pope. I'm coming to you from Ojai, California, and I'll be talking about resurrecting Score 11 in Siren Smalltalk. After a little bit of background, I'm going to talk about music input languages, which is the topic of the Score 11 research, and then focus on the Siren music framework within Smalltalk and about implementing Score in Smalltalk, give some examples, talk about the implementation. The background of software sound synthesis, or traditional computer music technology, started in the 1950s with programs people called sound compilers. And the idea was to take two, you had a program that took two input files, one of them your virtual orchestra, and one of them the score. And the orchestra was just a collection of descriptions of signal processing graphs, or flowcharts, for your instruments where you had modules much like the modules of an analog synthesizer that you could connect together, and eventually you had parameters for the input, and eventually the output was going to be a, a buffer of sound samples. And then you created a score file, which was just a list of timed function calls for these instruments. And the processing stages of the early systems were that you had a score processing stage, then so sorted the score, then the actual signal processing synthesis stage, and then offline playback and real-time performance so that you could have online playback wasn't available until the mid to late 90s. But I wanted to focus on the fact that from the earliest years, these systems included a pre-processing stage for the score. So you could write, initially it was Fortran functions to either generate the score from scratch or read a file of some formatted input, and then generate the score calls. So what we're going to be looking at today is the score languages. Now, it's ironic that 50 years ago, when I started my career, three things happened. Leland Smith published his landmark paper on the score language. Another composer at the same university, both at Stanford, John Chowning, published a paper on frequency modulation synthesis, FM synthesis. So these are important for computer music because score was the first flexible, high-level music representation language that a composer could use. And frequency modulation synthesis was just very efficient and powerful and flexible as a synthesis technique. Of course, we'll also remember that in 1972, the first small talk descriptions came around and people started thinking about integrated platforms with a development environment and a user interface, graphical user interface. So here is that last slide in pictures. So let's just go over music input languages a little bit. Again, since the early days of computers, people have been trying to make music with them. They developed these things, MRL is what I call them, they're music representation languages, but they're somewhere in the space between a programming language, a data modeling language, and a knowledge representation. So some of them look very programming-like, and some of them look very abstract and, and modeling-like. Uh, the first tasks people tried to do was just transcribe common practice Western music notation. We'll see examples of this coming up, but this is just a very pitch time centric view of music. Once people had done that, they said, well, how about describing compositional algorithms or musical structures in these programming languages? So the languages were expanded to include description of motives and patterns or serialistic or set theoretical. These are two composition techniques that were very popular in the 50s and 60s. Uh, later, things like stochastic composition or AI-based or machine learning-based composition algorithms were all able to be described in music representation languages. Getting back to the score language, the organization of the score file is that you have a bunch of sections that are just blocks of code with instrument commands, and then each single note is described by its whole list of parameters. In the higher level languages, though, you're allowed to describe, for example, the pitches of a whole series of notes in a single expression. And the more flexible languages, as we see, have special shorthand for describing rhythmic values, pitch structures, spatial locations, etc. So let's just look at some code examples. In score 11, 
If I just wanted to describe something constant, I could say something like, in this block, P5 is 74. It's that simple. I could also have a pattern, like a rhythmic pattern, I could describe with this expression you see on the second line of code, where it's got the slash marks implying repetition. So it says three quarter notes followed by two eighth notes followed by four quarter notes. So the rhythm would be da 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 Right, so that's just the rhythmic pattern, but it's pretty compact. For pitches, you can just use note names if you're doing something that uses the standard 12-tone scale. So this melody would be D, E, F sharp. Now, of course, if we combined that rhythmic pattern with that note pattern, you'd have a melody. Other options, as we see here in the next line, is just random selection. So this is saying P9, 100% of the time, between 3 and 8.5. The next is, is a, a, a moving random range. So here we're saying P4, move in 12 beats from the range of C2 to C3 to the range of C5 to C5. Here's a, here's a kind of putting it all together, a language, uh, an example in score 11 of transcribing common practice music notation. The block you see starts in the middle with that instrument command and goes up to the last line, the end. So this says we're defining a block for instrument one for 108 beats. And then we have the rhythm list and the pitch list and the amplitude. It's kind of the minimum that you need. And the output is going to be something representing what you see here at the bottom, which is the melody that we were just doing in the previous examples. Just a trivially simple example, but you see a, a language that is hopefully would be easy to take any score that you're given, like if we started with the score at the bottom and transcribed it into what are the rhythms, what are the notes. Now if we're going to jump and talk a little bit about the small talk world we're living in, I don't think I have to introduce what is small talk. We probably also remember going back to the 70s at Park, one of the first experiments was building music tools and the students in the eighth grade class did some music tools. So music has been an application area for small talk since day one. My day one in small talk was the mid 80s and I started with a package called Hyperscore and then Mode, which was the musical object development environment. And then since around 2000, I've been calling it Siren. But these are class libraries and uh, user interface tools in Smalltalk 80 and then in VisualWorks and then Squeak and now in Quiz. So this figure you see here is actually about 30 years old, but the yellowed out parts are the, the kernel that we're going to be talking about. And then around it, you have all sorts of tools for editing and higher level representation, and then ways of doing real-time performance. And But let's, let's just focus a little bit on the core here. The innermost circle you saw is what's called music magnitudes. So these are just magnitude models that are very flexible for things like duration and pitch and loudness. And instead of just being numbers, there are objects that support mixed mode arithmetic. So the classes can allow you to do things like say, one quarter beat plus 30 milliseconds, I suppose we seconds, milliseconds, um, or mezzo forte as an amplitude minus three decibels. An event itself is just a property list, so you can schedule them and you can do interesting things with them. Event lists just implement the composite pattern, so it, it is an event and it holds on to a, an ordered collection of events. But that class has loads of behavior for doing things with event lists, merging, sorting, uh, applying different functions to them, etc. And then subclasses of event list include things with names like event generator and event modifier. So these often have constructors that give you different ways of describing them, and then they either return or process an event list. So let's look concretely. This is a browser showing the hierarchy of event generator class. So you see above it, there's an abstract event and a duration event and a music event. So several levels of abstraction there. And then event list and event generator is a subclass of event list. And then you see the higher level abstractions like cloud and cluster and ostinato. And then what we'll be talking about today is the score 11 class. The score 11 class wraps a score 11 instrument block in its constructor expression 
and we'll see how this looks in an example in a moment. The SCORE11 instance can then parse these parameter expressions. And the SCORE11 instance can then create and return an event list, meaning the score that was described in the SCORE11 expressions. And of course, you can then use siren code, just messages to the event list, to post process or filter or merge or do anything you want to the event list. And there are also standard elements within Siren to allow you to perform it, like play it live over some output medium or store it to some formatted file. The methods that do this, as I mentioned, the object constructor in SCORE11 class creates the instance with an empty parameter mapped and an empty event list. And then the subsequent expressions, like the rhythm expression, hopefully, obviously, is normally one of the first ones because that creates the events, the timed events. And then other methods use the parse things like the note expressions to add, populate the features of the event list. And the methods to do this are very simple. Here's in the white text, uh, the method to handle constants. So you see the second comment where it says, for example, if I had score 11 add P5 mapped to 70. And what this method does, we see it has an event list. It gets the event lists that I'm operating on. And then it just has, it iterates over the event list with this do loop and basically says, get the time of each event. And if the time is greater than the start and less than the stop, then you see the last line. I say association event perform whatever property I'm operating on with whatever value I was given. So the property names are also aspects of the event, so I can just perform it. And again, due to overriding message not understood, this will have the effect of setting that property. So here's what it looks like to take a score 11 score and plug it into a siren method. Here's a, an example method in the class score 11. And well, it should be pretty obvious, and it's also got good comments. <laughs> so I, I create the score 11 instrument block. And then you see these uh, the list of parameters, P3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And you'll notice that some of them have assumed relevance. So I don't have to say that P3 is start time and duration, or that P4 is pitch, or that P5 is amplitude. I do have to say that P6, 7, and 8 are going to map to glissando and position and modulation index. So that's the whole constructor. And then you'll notice after that, I say S11, I set the tempo and I set the duty cycle, which is irrelevant. But then the next line is important. I say score gets S11 event list. That's going to run the whole score 11 processing and give me a siren event list. Uh, then I can flush the voices and I can plug in just a bunch of instruments. Last block is important. I create something called an OSC voice. And I'm going to plug that into where I say score, use the voice vox. This is now I plug in this instrument. The, the point being, the event list itself doesn't really know how to interpret its parameters. The voice is what we call a parameter to property mapper. So after I plug in the voice, I can just play it. And the open sound control world will take over and it knows how to do real-time scheduling. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But this is now a complete musical score, simplistic, but complete. Oh, the thing I, I jumped over, if we go back up to the P4, where it says pitch as chords, you'll notice the syntax where I have note associated with, and then I have the string where you've got F3 colon A4 colon C colon F. Those are four voice chords. That's just a shorthand. So here we see it's a, it's a Bach chorale, and you see it's just the slash says that's all one set of pitches. Most of the methods within score 11 that carry these expressions out are relatively simple, and they have loops looping over the event list. Uh, the special case, or the somewhat more complicated case, is these kind of score 11 expressions where you've got multiple segments. So here we see just a nested loop and you'll, you'll see the comment. It says step through the segments. So these are the different either parts of a move command or a you know any of the multiple commands that allow you to have different uh, set theoretical or stochastic operations within one expression. 
The outer loop goes over the segments of the command, and then the inner loop, where you say it says elist do, that's iterating over my event list. And in there, eventually, I'm going to say event perform property with value after I create the value of the property using whatever technique. But this is one of the more complex ones. So the whole list of these generators is just a few pages to take all of the score 11 expressions and turn them into operations on a siren event list. The last thing I mentioned, voices. These are these, they take the abstract parameters of voices and map them to some output medium specific connotation. So here we haven't talked about open sound control. It's just a, a UDP protocol for talking to synthesizers and uh, normally between something creating commands and something eating them, normally the, the thing receiving these commands being some sort of synthesis hardware or synthesis software. So the map here, as we see, so to take an event from an event list and map it to one of these commands, I just build up this little array of maps. So for example, I say take the event duration as seconds value as float, or take the amplitude value as float, or take the pitch as hertz value. So it's pretty simple. This is just the mapping of each of the P fields, the properties of my score, and mapping them onto some output medium. In this case, open sound control, but there are plenty of other examples. So what we're going to be looking at, the actual uh, running example, is a setup. Right now I'm just running on a Mac laptop. Um, I'd love to be running on my desktop, but VisualWorks doesn't work on the ARM Mac processors yet. Last time I looked, so I have to work on the old machine. I'm porting everything to Quis, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, the demo today is going to be on a Mac laptop. I've got Siren running within VisualWorks. It has a real-time scheduler that can send messages out uh, to different sockets or cables or several different streams at once, obviously. Right now, we'll be using MIDI, talking internal MIDI protocol to a software sampler using a program called Contact. And the contact player is just a synthesizer that sits there waiting for commands. And when you start it up, it loads a bunch of libraries of samples. So we'll see it's got a pipe organ and some Indonesian gamelan instruments, etc. The uh, sizzle is the create signal library. It's a package for sound synthesis that I worked with my students at UCSB for many years. It's on GitHub. It's um, very flexible, but it allows you to build synthesis servers, which is just a program that listens for messages over this UDP socket, and the, it interprets the messages as being open sound control, and then it synthesizes sound. So it's kind of a standalone synthesis server. Uh, this is what it's going to look like. I just want to get a screenshot because it's, it's kind of crowded uh, when you see the screen, but the, the very light yellow sort of Pale windows are all visual works. So you see a couple of browsers and a couple of down at the bottom, you see a transcript and a, a, what looks like a control panel. And then the top center, the yellowish window, is that's the synthesis server, the sizzle synthesis server, and it's just printing out usage messages. And then the blackish window in the lower right is the contact sample player. So there's a commercial product from Native Instruments that loads these samples and plays them. So now let's just escape from here and go. So hopefully you're seeing this. This is the, the same thing, just squished into a, a smaller screen. But here we see the contact sampler, and it's loaded with an organ and a glockenspiel and a marimba and an Indonesian gong sa. Uh, here we have a workspace outline, which is kind of a a, a little book, book object that I use for all my own demos and examples. Um, Here's a regular Smalltalk browser. But let's start up. Here's my Unix shell. I'm just going to start the open sound control server. And it's loading a bunch of instruments and setting up a library. I guess I should go back. It set up a library with 12 strings, 8 samplers, 16 FMs, 16 bell sounds, and 8 voice sum of signs sounds. We're not going to be using them all. So I've got that server running. I've got this server running. Now I can test them. So this is the Siren configuration. So for example, I could say test MIDI output by playing a scale. Hopefully you heard that. 
How about testing open sound control by playing a scale? So the, the point is the first scale was played here on the gong saw, and the second scale was played here by the C program that's listening to open sound control. So Siren is talking out two, two very different output media. But let's just play um, an example. We, we, we saw this melody ad nauseum, but we might as well play it um, just so you believe it. So in this case, this is exactly the, the kind of method we were looking at before. It's creating this simple melody from Pretorius and then creating a MIDI voice, channel four, which is going to be our Indonesian gangsa. And then I plug the voice in and play it. So if I go back up to this comment, score 11 melody B, Uh, we have the chorale example too. Here we see this notation of chords, right? I, I called attention to that before. This is also a, a very simple score 11 score. And here I'm plugging it in and playing it on the open sound control voice for the sizzle frequency modulation bell. And now if I play that, As you, as you can see here in the per usage percent, that long reverb takes about 30% of one of the processors. Uh, let's go on and finish with a, a little more interesting example. I'm working on a piece called Sleeping Sword. It's, it's actually almost an homage to John Chowning because it starts off with something that if you know John Chowning's early, early music, uh, this will be very reminiscent. So maybe I'll just play it. But as you can see, it's, it's almost all built using these stochastic tendency masks. So this is saying uh, the timing start with five seconds going from a constant value of 0.08 to a random range between 0.1 and 0.12. Then over five seconds go to a much wider random range. But then for two seconds just play constant. So that's just basically one long note. And then so you'll see we have short phrases followed by long notes, so it's going to be several of these phrases. And then the uh, pitches are also using tendency masks, as are the amplitude ratios. Then we've got a couple of fixed values. Left-right position, which you probably won't be able to hear, is panning back and forth. Uh, so I get the event list. I get just an excerpt of it. Remove the last note for historical reasons. Uh, compute the duration is important for some operations. Uh, and then I go through, create another block. And now here, what I wanted to focus on at the end is, even after I have them, I can apply a block to it. So here's an interesting thing. I'm going to take a score, uh, which is just, again, a siren event list. And I'm going to apply to a block to it that says, for each value, get the, if I get the, the P, the pitch, as hertz value from property pitch, and I justify it to be the pentatonic scale on the root of uh, D. Here you see for each, each separate se section, I'm applying, I'm rounding all the pitches to different scales. This is just an example of the kind of post-processing you can do with the built-in siren functions. So let's just play this out. Um, and I may have to figure out how to let you hear this in stereo, but at least now it'll just be recorded by the microphone. So just to wrap up, this was just in case none of that worked. 
I had example <laughs> slides to show you what was supposed to be happening. So again, here's the, the example from Tepsi Shoda that we heard. And I will think I'll skip over the sleeping score sketch. So um, there are still some things missing from the complete port of score 11, a few operations, uh, a couple items that are support for large scores or multiple tempo maps. And I'm going to be adding more post-processing methods specifically for dealing with tunings and spatiality, so surround sound locations and uh, radiation patterns. And I'm thinking about how to make real-time interaction possible so that the score 11 processing isn't batch processing, but is kind of on demand. So you have a, a score 11 server where you say, give me the time to the next event. As I mentioned, right now I'm in this limbo because I can't run the VisualWorks version on my current desktop computer, which is a Mac Studio. So it has just made it much more important to get it all working on Quis. Uh, the core is already running quite quite well up to the level of event lists and event generators. The user interface components, which we haven't focused on here, but there, there's a whole set of components for music notation within Siren. And most importantly, the voices and the schedulers are still in process, getting those to work in Quis and understanding how to do things like open up UDP sockets and talk to schedulers and things. So I'm actively looking for volunteers who either want to work uh, porting stuff to the GUI or doing the backend foreign function call stuff. So if, if anybody's interested, um, I'd be happy to entertain volunteers. The code for the VisualWorks version is all on GitHub. And if anybody wants to share, I can certainly put the Quis, Quis stuff on GitHub as well. So the references, uh, if you're interested in more, I've been publishing papers primarily in ICMC, which is the International Computer Music Conference. Uh, papers on the Smalltalk stuff since 1987. There are a number of journal articles, which are obviously longer than papers. And as I said, if you go to GitHub, ST Pope, Siren 9, uh, there are a lot of references up there. So with that, I'd like to turn off the PowerPoint and uh, invite questions or discussion. But thank you very much for your attention, and I hope everybody enjoyed Smalltalks 2022. Bye.